softly, children, walk softly, children, walk softly, children, find your freedom, little children, walk. Welcome to a special update episode of Sticky Beak. I am Joe Aguirre along with Jessica Fritz Aguirre. There's been a lot going on. We do have a whole bunch of episodes that are going to be dropping very shortly, including one in the immediate future. But a lot of people don't quite know what's going on. So why don't we set the stage for kind of where we are. Mark had a hearing after his arrest. Didn't quite pan out for some reasons. Just fill us in on where Mark is at right now and what's next for him from a legal standpoint on the gun charge. So we had a preliminary hearing scheduled, and then it was postponed for numerous reasons throughout the months. Once it was just postponed, then there was concern about COVID. I don't know if Mark had COVID or there was just an outbreak in the prison, but the hearing was postponed for that reason. Then he got a new lawyer, actually. He replaced his public defender with a new guy. Oh, sounds expensive. Well, that would always be my question, who's covering it. His name's Michael Boynton. As far as I can see, he hasn't represented Mark in the past. He hasn't been his lawyer on any of the other criminal charges that he's been brought up on. But this guy looks pretty legit. He graduated in 86 from Quinnipiac University School of Law, and he does criminal defense work among other things. His website specifies felonies and misdemeanors, which, yes, those are the criminal charges. So this is in no certain order. I actually arranged this so it reads better, but his criminal defense includes felonies and misdemeanors, driving under the influence cases, assault and drug possession cases. It's like if there was a Match.com lawyer app. Yeah. This would be like 100% match these two. Well, he also does some other stuff that's not just criminal, but Yeah, so he wanted time to review the file, and that's why the hearing was postponed for the third time, I believe. And you were sort of at the hearing remotely. I was. So I had to get credentialed to attend it remotely. That was one set of credentialing. And then another set of credentialing to audio tape and videotape it, which I did. Process wasn't that hard or anything like that. I was actually thrilled to be represented as a member of the media. Got my credentials. I attended the hearing, which was a little bit strange because it was on Zoom and it was literally the DA, Mark's lawyer, me with no camera and muted, and Mark Vincent. So I'm sure Mark Vincent saw a big JFA on his Zoom screen. Yeah, well, he looked like he, especially towards the end of that hearing, was trying to figure out who else was on the line. Yeah, he definitely, so once everybody hung up and left the conversation, I stayed. Because you linger on those phone calls. You do that to me, too, when we hang up. You always want me to hang up first. Well, it's not like I wanted to tell Mark how much I loved him or anything. I wanted to see if he would react, if he would do anything, and he did. He kind of stared into the camera. He did almost a double take, like he couldn't believe what he was seeing, and I thought he was going to say something to me, to be honest. And then he left. I thought he looked good. For what it's worth. You thought he looked good. Okay, so in the beginning of the hearing as well, and the reason I'm not bringing this to you via audio and videotape was that I was later told that that was a mistake, that they should not have granted me those rights to audio and videotape. But when I showed up originally on the Zoom meeting, his lawyer was there, the DA was there, and they started talking about what they're going to offer Mark, which is some sort of plea deal at the next hearing, which is tomorrow, July 26, 2022. So, yeah, I was contacted by the court later on and my contact there and told that I was not allowed to use the audio and videotape that I had gotten because what actually needs to happen is I need to place my request to do that on the record with the judge. Then it goes before the attorneys, and on both sides, they can decide whether or not they want to object. And if they do object... It's a mini hearing almost, like a sidebar before the actual hearing takes place where they debate the merits of letting me record. Now, I got away with it the first time. They made me promise that I wouldn't use the audio and video. But then after I agreed, they said, well, is that okay? 
And I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to piss off the judge, right? So I haven't used it. But tomorrow, as far as the hearing is concerned, they wanted me to put my request on record. And I don't think that, especially given that it's a live hearing, I don't think there's any reason for me to alert Mark or his lawyers that I'm there. So let's switch gears here for a minute and let's talk about Kathy Vincent, who I guess was out of the state when all the Mark stuff went down. Not sure how that timing worked out. Seems a little suspicious. But when she got home, apparently told some people she didn't know what happened or why Mark was in jail. What's that all about? She actually arrived home right when he was arrested. So she left shortly before he was arrested. And she arrived home shortly after he was arrested. An odd coincidence. Yeah, so that's their house in Milford. It's actually right down the street from Milford Christian Church. And I've gotten word from some people that know, both Mark and Kathy, that, you know, Kathy is kind of dumbfounded about why Mark's in jail. And she didn't even know that he was there until she got a letter from him. And then she told someone she still didn't know why he was there. She wasn't sure why he was at Bridgeport Correctional. She seems to know why now. She seems to have caught up, and she's actually blaming Paul for it. She said she's not mad at Mark. Mark's a great guy. He didn't do anything wrong. This is all Paul's fault. Well, Mark stole a gun and fled the state. So it's a little bit Paul's fault for having a gun when he shouldn't have, and I guess it's his fault for having his gun stolen by the person he told where the gun was. Well, let's not forget, too, that when he showed up to be interrogated at the police station, Mark burst into the interrogation room. And before they could Mirandize him, he said, how do you guys know that I took Paul's gun? Paul doesn't even know himself that it's gone yet. Hmm. All right. (laughs) So I have actually Brad Vincent has sent his brother quite a few letters in prison recently. And I just wanted to read from some of them because... Mark, I think you'll recall, wrote back to him once and said that all Brad does is spew BS and he's not right with God and he doesn't know what's going on. So, As if the guy writing from prison is right with God, though. Mark's brothers and sisters were actually feeling kind of badly, or at least some of them were, when their father passed away and they had gone to the lake to spread his ashes. And one of them said that when they hugged Mark and they greeted Mark, they felt badly because they thought, You know, maybe this is too much. Maybe our father would want us to embrace Mark. But now the word is from the brothers and sisters that if their father had known what kind of person Mark was and what he suspected of doing, then they would have told him, stay the hell away from Mark. He's bad news. But again, their father died without really knowing what the deal was. Well, they've largely heeded the advice to stay the hell away from Mark with the exception of Brad's elegant letters to Mark. Well, and he sends them, he keeps telling me, I'm not going to send anymore, I'm not going to send anymore. And so I have a few, and they're long, and I'm not going to read every single word. Maybe I'll put them up on Patreon. But here's some fun stuff that Brad wrote Mark recently. He said, even though pastors Loomer and Welch, that's Jim Loomer of Milford Christian Church and Pastor Rick Welch of Teen Challenge, even though pastors Loomer and Welch are hypocritical garbage, their support of you has also resulted in exposing their misdeeds and will hopefully result in charges against them. What's mind-bending is that through all this, you religious zealots claim to be doing the right thing in the name of God. Do you all really believe yourselves? And then, in true Brad fashion, he finishes, what a smoldering pile of shit. (laughs) Sorry, I can't. (laughs) It's just funny. So here's some more. I mean, you've heard this stuff before, guys, but it's just worth knowing that I think this is finally an opportunity for Brad to say a lot of what he wants, and he has that captive audience. So he wrote, Yes, I have a lot of anger directed at you, as all of your siblings do. For you to be able to ignore all of the damage that you alone have caused is incomprehensible. But the pain and anguish that you caused mom and dad is the worst. You put them through hell as they were trying to help you. So Mark, again, you need to realize that you are not trying to con someone you just met. We know you way too well. You are a very mentally sick person. You have no conscience and are therefore unable to take responsibility for any of the shit that you've done. Becoming a born again each time you leave prison and working for Teen Challenge ain't going to save you from hell. But hey, maybe in today's world where people like you aren't actually responsible for their actions, you have a chance in court. However, several of us are working hard to keep you locked up and get you charged for Doreen's murder. 
The best thing that you could have done with Paul's gun was to shoot yourself, but you were gutless and certainly didn't need 100 plus rounds of ammo to do that. So as usual, your situation was someone else's fault and they were going to pay. And then Brad copied the DA Matt Kultoff and chief venture of the Wallingford Police Department. That can't feel good for Mark. Well, I'll tell you exactly how it felt for Mark, because Mark actually responded after telling Brad that he would never respond to him again. You want to hear that one? Yes. So Brad wrote to Mark on June 3rd, and then five days later on June 8th, Mark wrote back. And it's all in caps, and it just starts, Brad, I will make it brief. How dare you list your BS because I didn't answer your last spewing. I never touched Doreen, nor did I kill her, you jerk. Sorry, I can't. Strong words. When I got this, I think I paused on that line and reread it a bunch of times before I was able to move on. Mark says, secondly, Donna's sister's husband was watching porn with my daughter. Fair point, I think, right? No film and camera seeing where she was in her thinking. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but I think what he's trying to say is he was trying to maybe get her to say something about watching porn with someone else by taking nude photos to see what her mindset was with like it right does that make sense to you that no it doesn't because a normal rational right. healthy human being wouldn't have ever done anything like that you might sit down with your kid and ask her if anything weird happened especially if you're close to that child and we know he was well that no film in the camera has always been a justification of his for why those pictures aren't bad even though we know pictures came out of the camera But this is new to me, that he was trying to figure out what she was thinking. So then he writes, I care not what you believe. No, I was not in your words. And then there's an ellipse here. And then it says, if, as you say, the cops were closing in, why would I go to Connecticut? Oh, I guess you didn't think of that. Everybody knew you were in Vermont. Right. So why would you go to Connecticut? Well, because you couldn't stay in Vermont. You have nowhere else to go because no one else likes you. You also left Connecticut once Kathy let you know that the police had come sniffing around your house. Then you went to Vermont. Then once the police came to visit you in Vermont, you left and came back to Connecticut. I mean, it makes sense to me, but... A lot of bullets, though. It's a lot of bullets to take. Well, but then he says, I guess you didn't think of that. I mean, I have to remind everyone that, you know, Brad is an engineer. I mean, he's extremely well-educated and he's extremely intelligent. So just want to consider the source, I guess. And Mark is in jail. Well, then he says, while I'm at it, no, I did not steal Paul's gun, period, the end. And the period at the end of gun is really big and bold. Like, he really worked on that period hard. What's his argument going to be in court that he borrowed the gun without permission? And that always depends on whether Paul is going to back him up or play the party line with the cops. We never know. And Paul must be thrilled to be in a position of power right now. He, of course he is. He had a chance to manipulate everybody. And then, like his mom, will probably, at the last minute, throw a curveball. Yeah, I, I just feel badly for Paul. I always have. And I know that he would scoff that I think that, but I just, I do. So then Mark finishes all that you say about my sister at the park, wow, Bradley, and he spelled Bradley wrong, <laughs> his brother's name. I'm sure that's not the only misspelling. You don't even care about facts. You just spew whatever. I left Vermont because of the amount of spraying in the air. Had to breathe. I don't know why I am writing. I really don't need to answer you. You can find the info yourself, and here he puts a website, geoengineeringwatch.org. I wouldn't put that into your, uh, I wouldn't type that into your internet. That looks like a virus waiting to happen. He Um, cares enough about what Brad thinks to write him back again, which is hilarious. But he says here, you can find the info yourself. You will not. That would involve some thinking, some seeking. Keep your next letter. Not interested. P.S. I do not need to answer your B.S. And so Brad had said, I won't write him again. And then he just wrote him again because that's how Brad deals with stuff, which I think is great. What's in there? Any highlights? He basically does a bullet pointed list of the shitty stuff that Mark says. Brad also brings up something that I repeated to him from the June 23rd conference that Mark said he's learning patience in jail. He was upset that he couldn't get an earlier hearing date before tomorrow, July 26th. He wanted something earlier. He kind of sighed. He said he's learning patience in court. But his lawyer also chimed in and told Mark specifically that Mark has not been, I guess, using his prison-given phone calls to his lawyer. He doesn't, like, use that resource. So the lawyer very rarely gets to speak to Mark. 
but he's he's doing well. Remember, he's very busy, he said. He keeps very busy. Making license plates? Yeah. So let's see. Brad says he never touched Doreen or Donna's sisters and didn't kill Doreen. Basically, Brad just says the fact that Doreen hasn't been heard of in 34 years is not perfectly normal. If it is, you're lying. Real quick, you know, early on, you remember I told you after my first conversation with Mark and subsequent exchanges back and forth with him, he suggested he doesn't lie. And I was like, all right, let me look at him. You know, maybe maybe it's the way he says things. But some of this is like the Amber Heard Johnny Depp thing where like, OK, there's no evidence that you did anything to Doreen, but you stole Paul's gun. Right. And we know this because Paul said it and the police arrested you for it. You didn't leave because of the air because you wouldn't have left in the middle of the night having stolen a gun. That doesn't make any sense. Well, that is so Brad brings up the fact that he visited the website. It's a bunch of BS. He says you left because you were getting nervous about the cops. Lots of teen challenge people, including Pastor Welch, and again, Pastor is in quotation marks, said that you were clearly agitated and behaving strangely. No one else had breathing problems. And then he says, the reason that you went to Connecticut is to get help from Pastor, quotation marks, Loomer. Pastor Welch was already getting pressured because of you, and you were running out of friends. Little did you know that Paul had turned you in for stealing the gun and also told the cops where you were going, which was why you were being surveilled. Didn't you read the police report? I did. Well, maybe Mark hasn't had a chance to. He's been a little tied up. So then Brad closes. So as usual, you're full of shit and continue to lie and deny. Until you are capable of taking responsibility for the horrible things that you've done, there's no amount of religion that can save you because you're still the same piece of shit that you've always been. You have no conscience. It's mind-bending to talk to you because of your incredible ability to deny what you've done And it does seem like you actually believe the BS that you spew. Fucking amazing. And then he attaches a copy of the charges and he says the world is woke and Mark may be able to lawyer his way out of things. He said, but it seems like a really solid bust and I will continue to do everything in my power to keep you behind bars. So I'm really looking forward to your 726 let's make a deal hearing. And then he signs off. This makes me laugh. He always signs off God Day to you, and he wrote God Day to you, asshole. And that was the 16th, and Mark, as far as I know, hasn't written Brad back, but I guess the day is young. Good to see Mark making the most of his time in prison (laughs) and is doing a lot of this, uh, as you said, learning patience to obviously self-reflect on the things that he's done. Now, just again, the recap tomorrow is going to be that hearing should be a plea offered tomorrow yeah i actually called the da i knew they weren't going to be able to tell me anything but i just wanted to test the temperature get a sense and da got a little pissed which i understand why he told me at the risk of being rude he wasn't going to tell me anything and i asked him if he had all the letters from the family members cautioning against light punishment for mark and he said he had them you know he has one from me as well but he has a lot from a lot of family members and he told me that he would contact the family members, which is appropriate. I'm not a spokesperson in any official sense, but... It stuns me that the amount of people that we've come across, including the DA, who, again, seemingly don't want any help because they're doing such a great job that they don't need any help with this. I find it stunning. I mean, again, a chief Ventura of the Wallingford PD is like literally the only person who's expressed any interest in actually receiving information and utilizing it. Right. And I don't know if that's because he's a young kind of hipper guy or whatever, but everyone else is kind of intimidated. I don't know if it's because you're a woman or if it's because you're a podcaster or because you're a podcaster woman. I don't know what it is. If I was a policeman and you were like, hey, I've done a bunch of research on this thing for you, I would want you to come in and give me the whole thing So, A, I could separate fact from fiction. I might pick up some things on the way and have a better, stronger case, but I don't know. 33 years? 34. 34, maybe you need a little help is all I'm saying. I don't know. Well, we went in there. I don't know how much I've spoken about this on the actual podcast, but we did go in there on February 28th, right after Mark had gotten arrested, and we had that three-hour meeting with Ventura and Forenza and DeMeo. And I think we said, you've said before, Ventura was extremely open and helpful, but I did send another FOIA request in the beginning of December, thinking to myself, of last year, thinking to myself, 
well, they can at least give me the dead leads. They can at least give me the stuff that they've looked at and sort of sloughed off. I sent that FOIA request and a follow-up to Forenza, DeMeo, and Ventura. And Forenza took the chief and the deputy chief off and responded to me that there was nothing more that I was going to get. So that's where we are with the police department right now. That's what he thinks. Uh, Yeah, well, you can't keep doing this. You know, the woman, Ellen, our our friend and one of my advisors who has, has coached me through a lot of this and counseled me on this, she went to the February 2020 FOIA hearing with us. Um, which was two and a half years ago now, more. And she reminded me that they said that there would be an arrest, you know, they wanted to ballpark it within the year, or at least an application for that. And it's been two and a half years and nothing more has happened. I actually have seen a couple people that I wanted to speak to have passed away. One of Mark's old friends, whose name I won't use, passed away. I was told by Teresa Lyon that that guy might have something to say. He's gone. And then Jimmy Farnham's brother-in-law, the one that runs the bed and breakfast and the one that found that small grave on the property with his friends, he died as well in November. So it's not like this case is getting any easier to solve as time marches on. So at tomorrow's hearing, you, I think, had applied to be able to do audio and video, but at the sake of having to step forward in front of Mark's attorney and the fact that clearly the state doesn't necessarily want you doing that either. You're, you're not going to do it. You att- you'll be attending by video? Tomorrow is a live hearing, open court. You know, Mark will be there. If anyone wants to go down and check it out, it's available online if you want to look it up. All right. And as you said at the beginning, we have quite a few episodes that are going to be coming out in the very immediate future. And I mean immediate. So yeah. keep an eye on your notifications for that drop. Yeah. So here's the deal with that. I've been working on something very, very hard and very extensively. It seems like I fell off the face of the map in the beginning of May when we released the last episode. That has not happened. It's just been behind the scenes. But information has been coming so fast and furious that I think, what, Joe, we have one in the hopper now, Mm -hmm. just about. And I don't want to say what it's about because I want it to be kind of a surprise. But we're talking some shady shit and we're talking some crazy stuff. So can I throw a tease out there? Don't give any details to this because I don't know much more than a little bit on this. I'll have to admit, I, I don't know enough of this yet. But what are you talking about? I've been talking your ear off for like two and a half months. Somebody may have heard. Mark say something in regards to his own responsibility for this. Well, that's a long, okay. That's a big teaser. It's a big teaser. teaser. And I'm just throwing out there because that's not a hundred percent confirmed or, but I, I know I heard that and I figured people would be jazzed up to hear that there could be something in the way of, I haven't confirmed that. So I don't know why that would be your spoiler, why we would go in that direction. But let me just say the dam has broken. This podcast has gone in a whole new direction, still very Doreen focused. But uh, yeah, I, let me just say, I mean, Mark's been off the map for me for a long time. The early 90s to me to the mid, you know, 2015, 2016, he's been off my map. And let's just say I uh, tracked him down. Mark seems like the kind of person who would have admitted something to somebody somewhere along the Stop way with the tea. i'm just saying like the guilty who i don't know that's all clearly all speculation but a lot of people have come forward we've heard pretty amazing testimony strap <laughs> in buckle up because there is some serious stuff coming your way uh, we've been in tears yeah listening to and talking about and talking to some of these people in the last couple of weeks you're i think you're getting misty right now no i think that's i think that's a definitely apt description. Uh, I had wanted these episodes to start coming out by Father's Day weekend. I don't know if you guys know this. I put it on the Sticky Beaks page, which you should join if you haven't. And join Patreon, too, for five bucks a month if you want. We're going to start putting some more stuff in there. But um, a bunch of us did send Father's Day cards to Mark in prison. Mine said something about, Dear Dad, how can I ever repay you for all the things you've done? And then you open up the card and it says, Shh. This card should be reminder enough or something like that. And yeah, it was bad. And then a bunch of people sent their own cards off to Mark in jail. So I wanted the stuff to come out around Father's Day because, you know, Father's Day is obviously an important date. It's right around the time Doreen went missing. It's the day that he went and visited his mother while she was gardening and didn't say anything about Doreen being missing. 
but I haven't been able to do that because the explosion information has been such that I'm constantly editing and revising and sort of opening my horizons and I, my mind is blown. Long way of saying I'm excited. So You can visit CloverCrestMedia.com backslash Sticky Beak and find the links for Patreon and uh, to get the latest release and to see all sorts of stuff, but a good place to start. But get ready and make sure you're subscribed because there is some serious heat coming in the next couple of weeks. For the amazing Jessica Fritz Aguirre, I'm Joe Aguirre. Thanks so much for listening to this update episode of Sticky Beat. Thanks, guys. Walk, softly children. Walk, softly children. Walk, softly children. Find your freedom, little children.